here's uh, my disclosure, certainly nothing relevant to this uh, talk, but there's a of label use of uh, PA catheters. So a little bit of history. What I'm going to try to do is make a case for the need of right heart catheterizations in patients with heart failure, or at least hemodynamic um, a assessment of these patients. So the history of the right heart catheterization or a PA catheter was initially described in um, 1970 by Swan, Gantz, and, and et al. <clears throat> That's how there comes the name. So the initial use was actually limited to coronary care units in patients with a acute MI and pump failure. In fact, there was a famous uh, acute MI unit here where he's uh, defined a lot of the hemodynamics. Uh, they, it was started, its use kind of uh, boomed in the mid-1970s. It was used in critical care units, surgical setting, and so on. By the mid to late 1980s, then the reports began to appear regarding the potential harm of these devices, so of these uh, uh, catheters, lack of clinical efficacy, increased complications. There was a call for a moratorium or multiple calls for moratorium starting in 1987, and its use significantly declined. I think I truly believe that the Swan GANS was one of the first um, uh, things that, that actually suffered from what I call fake news. So really the data is like if you have an EKG and you don't know to an EKG that shows acute MI, but you don't read it as that, you don't think that the EKG is bad. You think that the person reading the EKG really didn't, um, there was some knowledge gap. But anyways, the use of, um, uh, the use of right heart catheterizations kind of declined significantly. The use of PA cath, in fact, for thought there were going to be uh, more medical students and, and young physicians and non cardiologists. So I have a picture of what a PA catheter looks like. So, you know, just so you guys know what it is when you see it coming out of somebody's neck. Uh, so what has happened over the years is that um, most, most of the studies that show that pulmonary artery catheters are not beneficial were done in MICU patients, uh, mostly large retrospective, a few prospective studies, and l very low number of cardiology patients. And then we went the other way around, and the PA catheter was a, a study in patients with heart failure. That was the famous ESCAPE trial. But the ESCAPE trial only included patients who, are, who were congested. And uh, the inclusion uh, for those patients is, uh, as you see it um, over here, not patients who really uh, required um, a inotropes or so on, so a different population, and then the use of inotropes was actually a, a, an exclusion criteria. The other issue is that, you know, PA catheters, is, is, you're not, it's not a therapy, so in a sense, you don't expect an EKG, for example, to improve survival, but what you do with the EKG that might improve survival. So, and then they came up with this bright idea, well, in people since you can't interpret a pulmonary artery catheter, what about we come up with some algorithm, and then uh, which is what the famous uh, sepsis catheter was? So you make a, you measure CVP, you measure SVO2, and based on that you decide the butamine or fluids or pressors and things like that. Basically, what you should do should you have a, a PA catheter and know what's your what you're doing. So how do we use it these days, the, the hemodynamic assessment? Uh, we use it for diagnosis, prognosis, and, and management, and I'm going to briefly talk about each one of those. What about diagnosis? Is it really that important to make the diagnosis sometimes? And the short answer is yes. Uh, I'll do present a case first. You know, some of the fellows might probably uh, uh, seen this before. It's a 55-year-old man, previously healthy. He was admitted to an outside hospital with a non-ST elevation MI 10 days prior, arrested on the cath table, had a fresh occlusion of the RCA, also had an 80% left main. So the decision was made to uh, intervene in the, uh, on the RCA. The patient had an impella. The impella was weaned off several days later. Um, CTS turned the patient down because at that point his um, EF was 10 to 15 percent. He developed um, pulmonary edema after the impella was weaned, so had a balloon pump, another impella, 
then attempted PCI of the left main, third results, but okay, was extubated, pressure swing, and then he was again intubated 24 hours later. So at that point, the Animpella was uh, placed again. Now the patient is requiring pressors, dopamine, and dobutamine, and he's sent here. So we're a week after his, in his original hospitalization, so he was transferred for us, uh, to us. So what do we do? Do we go directly to the OR for an LVAD, we put him on ECMO, or we place a PA catheter, and you know, it's hemodynamic assessment, so that's a given. Um, so we are uh, on the Impella 2.5. So the, these are the patient's hemodynamics. So the PA 30 over 13, a wedge of 12, RA of 3, PA SAT is 75%, CO is 5.5, and a low SVR. So what do we do with this patient? Well, oops, I missed something in there. The what? Somebody said something? Oh. Uh, so the, sure after the patient came, uh, came in, he had a temperature of 102. This was a, if I remember right, vividly, this is a Friday afternoon uh, transfer, um, which is typical. Surprised he didn't end up on ECMO, though, because that's usually what happens with the Friday afternoons that transfer. But anyways, patient had a pneumonia, was treated. Um, so, you know, certainly PA catheter may have not changed this patient's outcome, but certainly changed our approach to it. And in fact, if you look at the different types of shock, when you're seen in the MICU, in the CCU, you know, and they teach uh, what they, what we are taught in medical school is that there are many different types of shocks. We have the distributive shock like sepsis, which is basically vasoplegia. You have the cardiogenic, which is a pump failure. You have the hypovolemic um, uh, uh, shock, which is basic uh, volume, and then obstruction that we rarely see, but tamponade and stuff. So what, um, if you look at the hemodynamic profiles of shock, and that's the way we define shock here, you have, a, when you have a hypovolemic, the main issue has to do with feeling pressures. Can you see an arrow there? No. What about now? Yeah. So the main issue is uh, that with hypovolemia, you have a, uh, issue with feeling pressures. When you have cardiogenic, it's a pump, cardiac output issue. When you have a distributor, you lost your SVR or afterload. So although we may not use the swans to diagnose every single case of sepsis, you know, sepsis is defined by a hemodynamic profile of whatever the patient might have at that time. Uh, kind of a side note is that the end stage of whatever shock you have, they all look the same. So. You know, that's what I put this in here, that at the end, either whether it's sepsis or cardiogenic, you lose your SVR, whether it's seps septic or cardiogenic, you lose your cardiac output and so on. So they all look the same towards um, a, a, the end, but at least at the beginning, it makes a big difference, like in this patient, as to which type of, of, of uh, shock the patient may have. So what are the... Uh, diagnostic indications, or how do we use a PA catheter for diagnosis? Well, for differentiation of shock, um, you want to look for discordant right and left ventricular failure. You can use it as a way of diagnosing severe heart failure that might require inotropic support. In other areas, we can use it for, uh, a, along with a, a LV pressure, for a diagnosis of constriction, restriction. Uh, so, so uh, for hemodynamic differential uh, diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, is this a precapillary, is this a postcapillary, uh, or a mixed uh, type? Is the patient a candidacy for transplantation or MCS, and then gives you prognostic implications regarding LVAD or BIVAD, or TAH for that matter. So what happened to our patient going back? Well, he was treated with broad spectrum antibiotic. As the pneumonia was treated, so the, he came in on a Friday, so Monday morning comes, uh, the lactate started rising again, the urine output started dropping, he was still had an impella on, we had gone down on the impella, but then uh, he decompensated, so now the feeling pressures are higher, the wedge is 25, RA is uh, 15, the PSI is lower, the cardiac output is lower, the SVR is 
returning back to normal. So as we took care of the sepsis, certainly the, the truth came out, which is the patient has a bad heart and is in cardiogenic uh, uh, shock. I usually joke that there's nothing better for an end-stage heart failure than low degree of sepsis. Uh, but sometimes you can go the other way. Um, so this patient eventually underwent an LVAD and was transplanted about a year ago. What about prognosis? Does uh, whatever data we obtain from a right heart catheterization has a prognostic implication? And um, start with another case. We call it case two and three. So it's a 44-year-old man that is referred to our clinic for consideration of advanced therapies. When I say our clinic, it's a heart transplant, heart failure clinic. He's obese, difficult to evaluate, JVP. He's a two Alabama units, I don't know. Difficult to evaluate, JVP, no H3, trace beta edema. You have an echo with an LVIDD of 73, EF of less than 25, moderate RV dysfunction. So patient A, or let's say two and three. So patient two, you do a right heart cath as a way of re-stratification, and we won't get into anything else that we did on the patient. Let's say it's the same exact patient. So has a mean PA of 43, wedge of 35, CI of 1.6, elevated RA pressure, SVR of 1,400, and a patient B with a mean PA of 28, a wedge of 18, RA of nine, a CI of 2.7, SVR or 1,200, which one has a better prognosis based on what we know right now? A or B? Correct, I mean, it's intuitive that certainly B has a better, but is there data for it? Heart failure fellows? <laughs> Anybody? Medical student? Nurse? Benita? <laughs> so actually there is data. If you look at data from, from inpatient and outpatient, from, uh, uh, there is data about the, uh, the, the, the hemodynamic parameters and prognosis. If you look, uh, I picked a couple. So these are patients in acute decompensated heart failure. This is from the original SCAPE uh, trial. So this, if you take a wedge and RA pressure, the sum of those, if it's uh, greater than 30, you pro at discharge, not at the time of the placement of the PA catheter. Certainly your outcome is much worse than if you successfully decongest that patient, not only death, but, but also death and hospitalization by a significant amount. So yes, there's data to suggest that whatever you obtain in cardiac uh, with the catheterization is actually important. More so, it's very important when you're treating acute decompensated heart failure to um, uh, renal function and, and cardiorenal uh, syndrome. Uh, this is a, a meta-analysis of a, a lot of the trials done with inotropes and vasodilators and things like that. And the main thing to look at is in patients who are decompensated, the higher your CI, the lower your creatinine is. And the lower your RA is, the better your, your um, creatinine is. So there's a correlation between uh, congestion and perfusion to the kidneys to the, um, um, and, and uh, baseline uh, and, and creatinine. So just keep that in mind. What about in a stable outpatient uh, uh, patients or, or stable outpatient setting? Yes, there's multiple data. In fact, there's data that if you have discordant let's say cardiac index as well as uh, VO2 max, that actually the cardiac index is as an indicator of prognosis is where more of a discriminator uh, than um, uh, VO2 max. And the, I just picked one of the studies um, that looked at these patients, patients with a lower CI without nothing else, they certainly have a lower survival than patients who have uh, better uh, index, and I think the cutoff was right around two. So, so yes, the, uh, whatever we obtain with the right heart catheterization and, and these hemodynamic parameters have a, a prognostic implications. So congestion, low output, um, the severity of shock, pulmonary hypertension, all those are, uh, have prognostic uh, implications. What about uh, management? 
and, um, and I'm going to try to divide it into acute decompensated a, a heart failure and then chronic heart failure. One, a couple of things is that the pulmonary artery catheter is mainly is essentially a diagnostic tool and so it can aid in the management of a patient but it's really you're not providing any therapy with the PAC so a lot of the times that when people uh, really get confused and that whatever data you obtain must result in action in fact there's multiple studies that for the sake of time I'm not going to include that certainly there's a the, the lack of action in patients with a PA catheter also results in a, in a in poor uh, outcome, and there's certainly a significant lack of knowledge uh, in, in hemodynamics, what, how to apply it, what to do for the patient, and, um, and outcomes. And again, I mentioned earlier that these uh, CVP and SVO2 algorithm, this sepsis catheter, is, is certainly derived of the hemodynamics. So I think because of the lack of knowledge, it's a way of taking the brain out of the equation and just put them into, you know, if, it's, if the CVP is less than X, do X. If the, if the CVP, I mean, if the SVO2 is less than 70, then start the butamine. Um, so what we look at in patients um, in cardiogenic shock and the way we use a PA catheter to manage them, if you remember these of patients who are warm and dry, warm and wet, and, and so on, what we want to do is we want to make, the, make, the, make sure the patient has adequate perfusion and make sure the patient is decongested. So based on how you are and what you find on the PA catheter, you either consider vasodilators and inotropes or diuretics and ultrafiltration. So you want to get the patient to be warm and dry as much as possible. Uh, <clears throat> and, and certainly where you are in here is, is, is also quite significant. For example, somebody who is warm and wet, they may not need inotropes. In fact, if you use inotropes in those patients, you're worsening their outcomes. And that has been studied over and over and over again. However, if you're cold and wet, I'm not sure there's much that you can see on the literature because if somebody's dying from low output and hypotensive, what are you going to do? Sir, are we going to give you epi or no epi? So there, there, you can't randomize a patient that way. But in the, in the observational studies, you see that patients who are cold or wet do benefit from inotropes. Occasionally, you can use vasodilators when uh, you think that SVR is okay and blood pressure will tolerate it. Going back to that initial uh, meta-analysis, there's a significant improvement also as you improve hemodynamics in creatinine level. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. So the, a lot of the outcome that we see in patients with acute decompensated heart failure, yes, has to do with output, yes, has to do with hemodynamics, and, but also with renal function. So like I tell the patients, if your kidneys cooperate, you'll be fine. If the kidneys don't cooperate, then we're in trouble. And uh, sometimes you have to make sure the kidneys are decongested and have enough uh, a perfusion. So the way we approach uh, shock, and I think I'm almost uh, out of time, but the, the, the way we use the PA catheter, certainly at any time of, of, uh, of uh, blood pressure determinant and shock, we'll try to use medications that might improve the outcome of the patient. Vasopressors, if it is a matter of vascular resistance, vasodilator, if it's a matter of afterload, inotropes or percutaneous MCS, volume resuscitation, or diuresis, depending on where the patient is, and at the end, certainly ECMO and stuff. What about in chronic heart failure? Is there a role for uh, hemodynamic monitoring in patients with heart failure? And yes, it has a prognostic implication. But also, these, uh, these uh, I'm going to maybe have a couple of slides on continuous hemodynamic monitoring. I know that a lot was said about it uh, yesterday. If you look at the time preceding hospitalization in patients who have a heart failure, there's actually a lot of changes that happen. And I think um, that certainly was uh, discussed yesterday. But by, if you look at what we see or what we can measure, it has to do, one, the first thing that happened is a hemodynamic congestion. So 
what you can see on the PA catheter, you can see on these hemodynamic monitorings. Uh, then there's the autonomic adaptation, not much to evaluate there. The impedance changes, uh, you can see in some of the uh, defibrillators and some of those other external uh, devices, and then eventually weight changes, heart failure symptoms, and then hospitalization. So if we do something like this, when we know that the hospitalization is going to happen here, and then you look what happened in the first, in the 20, 21 days preceding that, maybe at some point you can see what, by, at least by the time you get to have an increase in feeling pressures, you can intervene and then prevent a hospitalization. And uh, the, this, is, uh, this was uh, data as a result of the uh, cadmium MEMS uh, was uh, discussed yesterday. Uh, we don't have to do that. So the, the one thing that I want to show is that the, uh, I think it was mentioned yesterday, if you look at the patients on the original cadmium MEMS studies, there was a decrease in hospitalization, not really a decrease in... in in, um, in survival by tailoring the therapy and the hemodynamics based on the patient, based on the, pa on the patient's uh, feeling pressures and things like that. Of known, there was a, a trial before that, in fact, Dr. Borch was, was the national a, a PI, which was a different type of sensor, and that one actually failed because just a couple of people did not intervene based on the data. So what uh, the cadmium MEMS people did, if, you know, the, 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 as soon as they looked at the pressures and stuff, if there was no, no action based on the patients on what we had said as the patient uh, goal, then you would get a phone call. And, and, and so on as to how to optitrate the patient. But the, the point is that not only decreased hospitalization, but actually decongestion uh, decreased mortality also with a p-value of 0.06. Almost made it there, probably a you know, couple of uh, weeks more and would have done it. Now, cadmium MEMS is not the only one. I mentioned the a, a chronicle, that's the one that... A, Fail. There's a couple more that are uh, coming up in the near future. There's an, a HARPOT or a LA a pressure monitoring, and there's there's also a, a LV MEMS that um, that is implanted in the apex and gives you pressure like a, a ventricular pressure. So to summarize, um, the I think I'm over a couple of minutes. So Pulmonary artery uh, uh, catheterization is a single intervention that provides useful information for the diagnosis and management of patients with advanced heart failure. However, you need to act on findings. And um, because we are not that good in acting on those findings, then we have a bunch of P what I call a PAC impersonators, all these non, quote unquote non-invasive devices really don't provide the same degree of information that we need. Certainly, whatever we obtain on the right heart ca on the catheterization and uh, parameters of congestion as well as perfusion, they have prognostic information both in acute uh, and chronic heart failure, and the continuous hemodynamic monitoring with the cardio MEMS decreases hospitalization and uh, and mortality in patients with chronic heart failure. So help us stop the fake news about PA catheters. Go team swam, go PAC.